Hey everyone. So today we're going to discuss a little bit about coat color and genetics uh, for our lab in ANQ 102. Um, and we're going to get to equine genetics a little bit later on in the semester with Dr. Coleman, um, but it's a good way now to, to really talk a little more about phenotype, genotype, uh, and the basic coat colors that you guys are going to come across, okay, uh, in the equine industry. By no means will we cover every coat color that's out there, uh, but again, I want you to understand where the majority uh, of horses you see and those associated coat colors come from. And so we're going to bounce back and forth a little bit uh, between a PowerPoint and some slides just to give us some discussion points uh, and then kind of writing on the board a little bit uh, in regards to genotype. And so my hope by the time we're done uh, is again that you understand those basic coat colors, other associated maybe dilutions uh, or other modifications and like I said that genotype and uh, where they ultimately come from. And so if we roll through, um, the first thing that we're going to uh, discuss is basic coat colors, okay? It's important that you understand the three basic coat colors uh, of all horses, and they would be black, what we're going to classify as red, which includes chestnut or sorrel. Genotypically, they're exactly the same, okay? Um, and it depends a little bit on breed association or person, whether you're calling it a chestnut or sorrel, uh, and then bay. And so that black, red, and bay are truly our three basic coat colors. Brown, uh, we'll talk a little bit about. There's some controversy surrounding that. Many people will tell you no brown horse really exists. Uh, genetically, it is a bay, um, but again, we will discuss that. Uh, and so I'm going to bounce over to our whiteboard. Um, and again, I wanted to go through a little bit of the genotype with you. Uh, and so we're going to discuss a number of different loci today. And before we do that, uh, let me come back over here. So the low side we're going to discuss, we'll break them all down uh, here eventually, we'll put them over here, are white, we're going to talk about gray, we're going to talk about the extension low side, the agouti low side, and then we're also going to talk about the cream dilution, and we could talk about the done factor. And so we'll go through in this order and discuss all of these various low side. Before we do that, um, again, it's important that you guys are also remember back to uh, maybe basic biology class when we talk about the difference between homozygous and heterozygous, right? Okay, what do those two terms mean? And so homozygous, uh, we could have uh, homozygous uh, dominant or we could have homozygous recessive. And so if we're talking about this first loci, uh, the W. Uh, if it was big W, big W, again, that's homozygous dominant. If it's little W, little W, that's homozygous recessive. And then we could also have heterozygous, that heterozygous being big W, little W. And so again, that's what we mean by, again, homozygous and heterozygous. We could go back to your basic uh, Punnett squares. Uh, and if we were going to uh, talk about a horse that was, you know, EE, -E, and then this horse over here, uh, maybe we go through and we say they're little e, little e, okay? We know that the resulting progeny are what? Essentially, they are half that are heterozygous and then half that are homozygous recessive, okay? Uh, and so again, Punnett square is always something that you can uh, go back to. And so we'll start going through all of these loci as we go through this PowerPoint. But again, I want you to be familiar with the, the ones that we are going to discuss. And so if we go back to what you see in the basic coat colors, again, we mentioned that uh, black, red, and bay horse. Um, building on that, let's go to the first one that we just mentioned, and that is the white horse. Okay. White horses are actually pretty rare. Uh, the likelihood that too many of you guys have seen white horses or had white horses is, uh, like I said, is a small number. It's a minority for sure. Um, this is something that a uh, horse is solid white at birth and uh, during its entire lifespan. Uh, most people, we, you know, misnomer, we say, oh, it's a white horse and it's usually actually what? It's usually a gray horse, especially depending on that base coat color. As they get older, they almost start to look white. Um, and more often than not, again, genetically, it's a gray horse and people are just saying white. Um, again, white gene itself is truly pretty rare. We're going to talk about the combinations of various homozygous and heterozygous and, and combinations of that uh, loci. 
Uh, it is important to note that homozygous dominant, big W, big W is a lethal gene. These horses don't, uh, don't exist in the population, okay? Uh, they might survive until birth and then uh, uh, they don't survive very long after. A true white horse has pink skin, okay? All the other coat, coat colors that we talk about today are gonna have what color skin? They're gonna have black skin, okay? Uh, and again, truly it is a, a rare color. And so if we go back to our whiteboard uh, and we start to write out each loci, we'll write them out as we go along today, we could talk about white and we're gonna say big W, big W, and this is gonna be, we're just gonna say lethal, okay? And so, and then big W, little w, this is going to be our white horse, and then little w, little w, not white, okay? And so there's no expression of that white. White, when we talk about it, and the reason that we talk about it first and why that's important uh, is because it's what we call a color obscuring gene, okay? If we talk about a horse and all of a sudden they are uh, dominant uh, at this uh, white loci right here, um, that's one of those things that uh, you don't need to look any other uh, or need to look any further down the line, okay? It doesn't matter what the gray or extension loci or goody or any other ones uh, are, okay? If they are, in this case, uh, dominant here and, and heterozygous, uh, being that this is lethal, it's color obscure and it doesn't matter what's down the line. So you can essentially stop, okay? So let's move on from our white horse uh, and talk about that gray horse, okay? And so as we move on, we could talk about that horse that has a dominant gray gene, okay? And so this is that gray loci now. The cool thing about gray horses is they are born a particular base color and then they lighten with age. And so it's always a little bit of guesswork on, oh, we're gonna have a gray foal, are we not? And again, at a, at a young age with these foals, it can be tough to tell. You might start to see some white hairs kind of interspersed around the eye or in different parts uh, where you're starting to guess as they shed that first full coat uh, on whether or not they're going to gray out. But again, they're born a base coat color. So they're born, you know, maybe that red or black or bay uh, or maybe something else, but they're going to lighten and gray with age. Okay. And this is kind of that graying process that we have. Uh, and so you can see even in this little guy right here, uh, a little tough to tell, okay? You can maybe see some white hairs on the face as it starts to shed out a little bit, um, but you, you're still guessing a little bit on whether we're gonna have a gray horse, okay? Uh, and you can see as we go through this process, uh, they lighten with age, have more of this dapple effect sometimes. Now, depending on the base coat color, uh, this one's got black points. We'll talk about what that black, or what black points mean here in a bit, uh, but you can see black mane and tail and uh, lower legs a little bit as well. Uh, whereas if you had a lighter coat color uh, underneath, maybe it was a red horse, everything may look white, though it is, again, genetically that gray horse. The other thing to note when you looked at this is you see this little guy and you're guessing if he's maybe going to be a gray horse or not, but you look behind and you see what? you see mom or the, the dam that is gray, okay? Uh, and so it's important to note that to have a gray horse, one of the parents has to be gray, okay? Either the stallion or the mare has to be gray to then have a uh, progeny that is gray. If neither one of the parents is gray, then somebody messed up along the lines and you uh, maybe bred that mare to the, to the wrong stallion or who knows what, but uh, again, one of the parents has to be gray to have a resulting gray foal, okay? And so we can duck back over to our whiteboard. We're gonna keep going back and forth a little bit today as we write out the various low side. And now we could talk about that gray horse. And so if we come over here, we'll just write out uh, essentially for big G, big G, or we're gonna say big G, little G. And then this is our gray horse, little G, little G, what? Not gray, okay? Just as simple as that. Now, gray is what we call a color masking gene, okay? White, I told you, was a color obscuring gene. Gray is a color masking gene. And so white, you didn't have to look any further down the line. You knew it's gonna be a white horse if you are dominant uh, at that uh, white low side. Gray, you can say, well, it's dominant, but it's gonna mask that underlying color. Um, and again, that's just one of those things to, to note. And so born the base color, lightens with age, considered to be a color masking gene, okay?
And so now we move on to the extension and the agouti loci next, which is where we're going to get those basic coat colors. It's a combination of those two loci uh, and those genes together. And so now let's go back to uh, our PowerPoint and walk you through a little bit of those basic coat colors. And so I'm going to talk about uh, black, um, we'll talk about red, and we'll talk about bay. And then let's go back and talk about those various loci and how the combinations might give us those particular horses, okay? Uh, and so the black horse, uh, black pigment uh, on their skin, uh, again, what you'd expect. Um, most horses have black pigment on their skin. Now, they can have markings. Markings are, are not indicative whatsoever of coat color. You see this horse uh, on the top here that has the star and the snip, perfectly fine. Again, that's just a, a totally different uh, marker and set that's affecting those. Um, extension loci in control, that black horse, we'll talk about extension and agouti here momentarily. Two types of uh, black that you may come across just in discussions with people and horses. Um, one people will call a uh, typical black, uh, and so that's what you would see in this bottom right here. Uh, sometimes in the summer months or in the sun, uh, this horse will bleach out, uh, and then other months you'll see them a little, a little bit darker and shinier as well, whereas this jet black, uh, again, they stay a dark, rich black all the time. Uh, and some people will mention that on a, a stallion breeding or things like that, that this is a, a jet black. Let's talk about that bay horse, okay? So the, the second of our basic coat colors, um, this is a horse that has a red base coat color, and then it has black points, okay? Um, and so truly, this is what uh, is our bay horse now. Uh, and so you can see reddish body coat, as we just mentioned, and then black points. What do we mean by that? Black mane and tail, lower legs are black, ear tips maybe a little bit, um, but that's exactly what we mean by black points, okay? Uh, and so that bay is, again, reddish body coat color, black points, black mane, black tail, lower legs, um, and then maybe uh, ear tips, okay? can have markings, again, that's not going to affect, you could put a star and a snip on this one again, um, and uh, that's still going to be your bay horse. Uh, again, usually leg markings uh, are going to have uh, dark hair above and you're going to see that, but uh, again, you might still have some facial markings on them. And then we could talk about that red horse. Again, genetically, that chestnut and the sorrel are exactly the same, uh, but when we talk about that red horse, again, red, reddish brown, yellowish red, coat color, there are some variations to that, no black points on it whatsoever, um, and you see a few different uh, variations uh, here, we're going to talk about uh, dilution of that red here in a bit. And so let's go back to our whiteboard uh, and walk through some uh, of the genetics and the genotypes uh, as it's associated with uh, um, each of those loci. And so the extension loci and the goody loci. How do you get those three basic coat colors? Okay. And so if we come back over to our whiteboard right here, um, I, I'm going to write this out and uh, again, this is one of those things that can be a little confusing sometimes, um, but for the extension loci, we'll, we'll just, oh, let's see here. So we'll just erase that a little bit. And so for the extension loci, this is one of those things that we're going to look at extension first and then goody, a goody. And so this is that extension loci, okay? And so if we are dominant at the extension loci, so either homozygous dominant or heterozygous, if we are dominant at that, we're gonna say we have black, but don't know where. Okay, what does that mean? We'll get to that. If it is little e, little e, this is your chestnut or sorrel horse, red, okay? So extension loci, if it's recessive there, homozygous recessive, it is a red horse. If it is dominant, we have black, but we don't quite know where that black is. Now we're gonna look to the agouti, okay? And so let's put that here. Look to the agouti, okay? So let's talk about the agouti loci, and then we'll make this come full circle at the end. Uh, I'll give you guys, uh, again, a chance to look at some genotypes uh, and understand better how we get a lot of these combinations. And so the agouti loci represented with that A, again, if we are dominant here, so homozygous dominant 
or we are heterozygous, this is going to say black is restricted to only the points. So what does that mean? This is where you get that bay horse, okay? If we are homozygous recessive here, little a, little a, we're gonna say black is over entire body. And then this is where you get that black horse, okay? And so here you got the red, the bay, and the black. Those are your three basic coat colors. They come from a combination of that extension loci and that agouti loci, okay? And so if we are recessive at extension loci, homozygous recessive, we get that red horse. If we're dominant, either homozygous dominant or heterozygous, we have black, we don't know where, we look to the agouti. And with that agouti, if we're dominant there, uh, black is restricted to only the points. Uh, again, we get the bay horse. If we're homozygous recessive, black is over the entire body, and you get that black horse, okay? Uh, one thing to note, uh, we'll just put a little star here, is agouti has no effect on red horse, okay? And so if you have this horse that it is homozygous recessive here, little e, little e, and it's dominant at the agouti, it has no effect, okay? That agouti only comes into play if we are dominant at the extension low side, okay? Cool. And so that's where you get, uh, again, your three basic coat colors. Now you guys understand where our white comes from, our gray, our extension low side, and our agouti, how those interplay, and then cause our three basic coat colors. Now, there's still a number of other coat colors that I want to discuss with you today. And so just to go over some of those, and so now I want to talk to you guys a little bit about the brown horse. Um, again, there's some controversy surrounding that when you take uh, equine genetics with Dr. Coleman, he will very adamantly tell you brown does not exist as a color. Um, genetically, it is the same as a bay horse. Um, but again, there's always some debate surrounding this. Some registries or breed registries do claim this as a color, so I want you to be familiar with that. Some list it uh, as a dark bay. And so Next, I want to talk to you about uh, two different loci that I've mentioned on the whiteboard that we will, uh, again, completely write out all of those loci. Um, and th that's the cream gene, uh, where we get our buckskins, palominos, cremelos, and perlinos, uh, and then where we get the, uh, the dun gene, okay? Um, and so this is, uh, again, ultimately where we get uh, a number of our different duns, and we'll talk about those dun factors. And so let's go back to our whiteboard and talk about the nomenclature. It can be a little confusing. I didn't come up with it, um, but I want you to understand uh, that cream gene and then we'll move on to done. And so when we look at uh, our whiteboard, uh, again, we've gone over white, gray, extension, agouti, loci. Now we're on cream and then we'll get to our done. And that's all the loci that we're going to uh, discuss today. And so if we come down here below our agouti, uh, we could talk about the cream gene, okay? And so the cream gene, we'll talk about this as CC, okay? And so this is, again, one of those things that's not always the, the easiest uh, to understand. Um, but when we write big C, big C, we're going to understand this to be what we would call fully pigmented, okay? Now, we can have one or two copies of the cream gene, okay? And so let's talk about one copy first. This is still going to be C, and then it's going to be big C, and then little CR, okay? This is going to dilute red to yellow, and then does not affect uh, black points, okay? And so, uh, again, we'll just understand that as one copy of the cream gene, okay? We'll write that so it's a little clear right there. So big C and then big C, CR, okay? And so this would be essentially one here, and then this is all one. And so this, as you kind of understood this correctly, if you drew a line through here, you'd see fully pigmented. Now we all of a sudden have one copy of the cream gene. If we're talking two copies of the cream gene, you could essentially write this two ways. You could write this as big C and then CR, and then big C and then CR again. That would be two copies of it. Or many people would write this as big C, CR, 
squared, okay? Uh, and that's, again, two copies of the cream genes. This is a what we would refer to as a double dilution, okay? And then with this double dilution, uh, this is where you get your uh, cremellos and your perlinos, okay? Um, and so let's talk about what's the resulting factor. And so we mentioned one copy of the cream gene dilutes red to yellow does not affect the black points. Uh, one copy. So if you take that red horse, so that chestnut, that sorrel horse, and you give it one copy of the cream gene, change the red on that horse to yellow, what do you get? You get your palomino, okay? And so one of those options would be that palomino, okay? And so if you take your bay horse and it does not affect black points, as we said, okay, we take that bay horse and we turn the red on it to yellow, what do you get? You get a buckskin, okay? And so this is ultimately where you get those palominos and those buckskins, okay? One copy of the cream gene. Now, when you start breeding two palominos together or a buckskin and a palomino together, uh, et cetera, and you have two copies of the cream gene, that's where all of a sudden you get your cremellos and your perlinos, okay? And so, uh, yeah, I just want you guys to be familiar with that. Um, so now we've gone over where you get your whites, where you get your grays, uh, basic coat colors with the extension and agouti, low side, the interplay of those. And then with the cream gene, now you understand where you get, again, with one copy of that, uh, where you get the palomino and the buckskins, with two copies of the cream gene, where you get those cremellos and your perlinos. So now we've got a good bit of the population of the horses that you guys come across on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, and you've been able to capture that uh, in phenotype. And again, we'll write some of these out and you'll understand uh, all of that. The last one that we could talk about from a low size standpoint uh, would be what we refer to as the Dunn gene, okay? This is just captured as a D and it's our classic notation. And so if we are dominant here, big D, big D, or big D, little d uh, expresses, we'll say, Dunn factors. And we'll talk about what those Dunn factors are. And then if it's little d, little d, not done, okay? Simple as that. And so let's go back to our PowerPoint and talk through some of those various horses uh, and those cut colors that we might come across as a result, those various duns uh, and cream dilutions. And so that buckskin, uh, again, genetically, it is different from a dun horse. There's always some confusion around this. Uh, again, this is just that bay horse with a single copy of the cream gene, okay? And so you've taken this horse, uh, what looked like a bay before. You turned the red on that horse to yellow. Now you have a buckskin, okay? Uh, no primitive markings on it whatsoever. That's going to relate to that done that we'll talk here momentarily. And so again, it does have those black points on it with a yellowish body color, okay? This palomino, we could do a number of different shades of the palomino. You see this little one here. Um, they can be lighter, darker, uh, but this is that red base coat color, chestnut or sore, remember. You turned all the red on that horse to yellow. There was no black points anyways, okay? Turn all the red on that horse to yellow, you get your palomino, okay? And so single copy of the cream gene. Um, and then we could talk about done factors, okay? Done factors, uh, some people refer to them as primitive markings. This would classically be known as the dorsal stripe. And so you can see the dorsal stripe down this horse right here. You can see it on this one right here. Might be also uh, noticeable with leg barring. And so this is that kind of zebra stripes or leg barring and then tipped ears, okay? And so these are all done factors or primitive markings that would be exhibited if they were homozygous at that done loci. And so if they're either homozygous dominant or heterozygous, if they're dominant at that done loci, they're gonna have these primitive markings. Some show more than others. Some you just see a dorsal stripe, some of the dorsal stripes faint, some you might see more leg barring, uh, but it's a result of that done factor. Uh, and so that's just showing, this is one of the Chevalsky's horses, showing you some tipped ears, showing you that dorsal stripe again, okay? And so you could take a number of base coat colors and then also be dominant at the done loci and get things like a red base coat color, okay? That red chestnut or sorrel horse uh, activate the, the dun gene, and then you see this red dun. You see the dorsal stripe down this horse right here, okay? Uh, we could talk about a bay dun, uh, buckskin dun. So this would then be the combination of, still looks like a buckskin, that yellowish 
uh, coat color, uh, black points, and now you see that dorsal stripe a little bit, okay? Uh, you might see some evident leg barring or tipped ears, okay? Uh, but that's the buckskin done. Uh, Drula, uh, this is a black base coat color uh, with a dun jean, okay? And it actually turns some of the hair this somewhat yellowish color. So we call this a Drula. It can be various shades, some are darker than others, uh, but this would be that Drula or mouse dun, okay? And you can see the dorsal stripe down the, the back of this horse. I can see some evident leg barring right here. Uh, and so again, one of those things just to point out black face mask usually on them but this is known as that gorilla or mouse done. So we've talked about all the various loci that we're going to mention and again how you got that white horse that gray horse the color obscuring color masking lightens with age with the gray our basic coat colors our black our red our bay and then also we went through a couple of bits with the dilution of the cream gene and then that done factor that's a good bit of horses the next one we discussed, we're not going to talk about the, the genotype at all, okay? So roans are another one that we could mention in regards to coat color, similar to the gray horse, but they have a white hair influence that they're born with, okay? And so these, they might change a little bit in their look over time and aging, but again, predominantly they're going to stay the same. They're not going to lighten with age like that gray horse did, okay? Um, and there are a number of different uh, roans. And so again, you get that base coat color and then you activate the roan gene. This would be expressed as an R, uh, but they are born with that uh, 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 base coat color. And so this would be what we would refer to as our red roan. Um, this would be our blue roan with the back, with the black base coat color. This would be our um, red roan with that red base coat color. Uh, and then many people just refer to this as a roan. Uh, essentially, it's that bay uh, roan, uh, but it's that bay horse that uh, that has the the roan gene. Okay. Paints paints are always interesting. Uh, again, this can be super complex as you get to the genotype of these. That's not my point of today. I uh, will just mention the four basic patterns associated with some paints, uh, and we'll leave it at that. Okay. Those would be the Tobiano. Overo or frame Overo, Sabino, and then splashed white. Uh, and I just want you to be familiar with these, okay? You could uh, get into the genotype of these for a, a long time. Overo, I want you guys, you could also use the word frame Overo, um, but I want you to look at uh, some of these horses uh, and realize with the Overo horse, so if we looked at this horse right here uh, and the top line, white does not cross the top line, okay? Sometimes you'll just have a thin line of color across the, the top line, uh, and then people would refer to that as a frame overo, but again, with that overo, frame overo, white does not cross the top line, okay? With the Tobiano, like this one in the bottom right, white is allowed to cross the top line. Um, you can get combinations of, and some Toveros and other things. Again, I want to keep it simple with the, the four basics. So, again, uh, you know, Vero, uh, white not crossing the top line. Tobiano, white crosses the top line. This is what we refer to in the bottom left here as splashed white. Uh, I like the uh, analogy of this um, from APHA, American Paint Horse Association. It's essentially like you took that horse and you dipped him in a paint bucket, okay? And so you can tell that this horse essentially is splashed white, was dipped in a paint bucket about up to here, okay? All his lower legs and the bottom part of his barrel uh, right here and abdomen is white. And then this would be our Sabino up here, kind of this speckled flecked appearance to that Sabino. Okay, so those are our four basic uh, patterns with the paint horse. We're not going to worry about genotype. Like I said, it gets extremely complex. So we've mentioned some roans and some paints. We could lastly mention some Appaloosas. Again, white with any color. Um, this is one of those uh, that can be fun to identify, uh, but genetically uh, pretty hard to talk about the genotype and hard to distinguish. Okay. Four primary coat color patterns to the Appaloosas. Uh, the one up here in the top right is probably one of the most commons, uh, where this would be the, the blanket Appaloosa. Um, and then in the bottom here, this would be the leopard Appaloosa. Okay, looks like a leopard essentially. Varnished roan, again, has this speckled or flexed appearance to it. Uh, and then the snowflake is basically the inverse, I think of it as this leopard, okay? So darker base coat color and then white spots all over, like dropping snowflakes on top of that horse, okay? Um, and so again, the blanket app, very, very common, um, but you might see a number of different Appaloosas out again, most of them stock horse type, um, but genetically pretty hard to uh, distinguish. The last thing I wanna mention to you guys um, is facial markings. And we're gonna jump back to our whiteboard uh, here in a moment and talk about some of these various combinations of genotype. 
And so with our facial markings and leg markings, for that matter, we'll also mention, um, we could have something like our star up here. You could have any combination. We could have um, our stripe or strip, we would call it, our snip on the lower nose. We could have a blaze, okay, usually just down the bridge of the nose a little bit. Uh, and then we could have a bald face. This may even encompass an eye. If this bald face all of a sudden has white over the top of the eye, usually you get the resulting blue eye or glass eye because now that eye lacks pigment because that white goes over top of it, okay? That blue eye glass eye uh, is usually a bit more sensitive to light than uh, a normal eye, okay? Uh, and so some of these horses, we get some Cremellas, Pelinos, et cetera, that are blue eyes and they get really squinty, especially uh, at a young age, okay? Um, and so again, you can have any combination. You could have a, a disconnected star strip and snip um, versus going to something like a blaze. You could just have a star and a snip. And so any combination uh, of facial markings exists as well. Leg markings, just to mention, uh, we could have something like uh, this, which we refer to as a coronet, just right above the coronary band. Here's our good half pastern. A full pastern would come just to right here. Uh, this would be our fetlock or ankle. Um, Sock or half stocking, uh, honestly, anything in this range right here uh, is a sock unless it's a full stocking uh, and it goes all the way up to the knee, okay? So this referred to as a stocking. Anything else within this range would be a sock, uh, again, up to here, up to here, et cetera, unless it's a full stocking, okay? And I've got a couple of photos just to show you. Uh, this is who, anybody know? This is Secretariat, okay? So Secretariat, you would say, I need you to be all encompassing. Uh, and so you would say this, it's a red coat color, okay? Uh, and so we could call a chestnut or a sorrel horse. Uh, and then this is a horse that has three white socks, okay? They don't go up quite high enough to be considered full stockings, uh, but he has three white socks. Um, and again, a little bit tough in this angle to, to see any facial markings. We could look at this horse. Um, and we could say it has a, a very small blaze. They're all connected, uh, the star strip snip essentially, and so they're not disconnected, but a uh, very small blaze right here, bay horse, right? Uh, and so red with our black points, we see maybe a coordinate here, a fetlock there, and maybe a, a pastern there. Uh, and so again, I want you to, to understand how to evaluate looking at coat color, as well as facial and leg markings. You're filling out a Coggins. Uh, again, you gotta write down everything that exists, okay? You're selling a horse, you're gonna write down everything that exists. Uh, and so be familiar with various coat colors uh, as well as markings. And so with that being said, let's jump back to our whiteboard for a moment um, and talk about some various different uh, genotypes. And so we went through, uh, we'll talk about them up here, we went through um, the white, the gray, the extension of goody loci, cream gene, dun gene. And so the way we would write this all out, let me give you a few examples. Let's write them out and then we'll walk through each of them uh, together, okay? And so let's just do here, we'll do this, think through them a little bit. We'll talk about a couple of these. You guys need to be familiar with how to work through these various genotypes, okay? Um, and I haven't even worked through them, I'm just writing them out. Okay. Okay, we could do these all day, but let's work through these right now. And so, I want you to essentially go through in this order. So you're gonna say for this one, what? Not white, it is gray, but that gray is just color masking. So let's see well, what color this horse is born as. This tells me it's the red horse. This tells me uh, a goody low side, but it doesn't matter on that red horse because there's no uh, black whatsoever anyways. Fully pigmented, so again, no cream dilution whatsoever and not done. And so this tells me what? We have a gray horse, 
and then it's essentially born chestnut or sorrel, okay? It's gonna lighten with age. So we look at this one, not white, not gray, has black, but we don't know where. Oh, now it's restricted to only the points. And so what do we have? Up to now, we have our bay, okay? Has black, don't know where, restricted to only the points. We got our bay, fully pigmented, and now all of a sudden we have our dun gene, okay? And so you could talk about this bay dun, or some people would just refer to this as a dun horse, okay? Um, this would be not white, not gray. This would be red. Uh, Agouti has no play on that red horse anyways. One copy of the cream gene, so change that red to yellow. What do you have up until now? You have a palomino and then not done. And so this would be that palomino, okay? Uh, not white, not gray, has black, don't know where. Restricted to only the points. Uh, actually, let's just change this one for the fun of it because uh, we already did one that was similar to that. Um, and so now let's just say it was little e, little e, and then a, a, okay? Little a, little a. And so not white, not gray, uh, has black, don't know where, black over the entire body, uh, one copy of the cream gene. Um, and uh, again, uh, now we have our um, done factor. One thing to note that I didn't tell you is for the most part, uh, this cream dilution has no effect on that black horse, okay? There's no red to turn to, to yellow, okay? Some people would talk about this uh, silver factor a little bit. We're not going to get into that. Uh, I guess I should have just kept that a, um, uh, a bay horse, and then we could have just had our regular buckskin, um, and so let's just do that. So we'll call this our buckskin, and we would just go back and We'll change this back to our dominant agouti loci. And so like I had it before, better setup. So not white, not gray, has black, don't know where, restricted to only the points. This is our bay horse, one copy of uh, the cream gene, turn that red on that horse to yellow. We get our buckskin and then not done, okay? Um, if you wanted to do one more, we could then do, let's just do this here, here, uh, let's do big E, big E, little A, little A, big C, big C. This is an A there. Uh, and then little D, little E. So not white, not gray, has black, don't know where. Black over the entire body, fully pigmented, not done. This is just that black horse, okay? And so you can see how we could go through. And again, if you have questions on this, let me know. But you could see how you could get the various genotypes um, and decipher them to get the resulting phenotype. Uh, and so a number of different ones that we listed. And again, I didn't do these prior to, to see what the re result or outcome might be, um, but I want you to be able to work through. Uh, if you wanted to look at another uh, base coat color, you could do, again, we could do one here. Let's see, this is uh, little e, little e. Um, we'll just do this for fun. And then let's say C, C, D, D. This is what, not white, not gray red, agouti has no effect, fully pigmented, not done, and so this is just that red horse, chestnut, or sorrel, okay? Um, so lots of different things that we could do uh, in combination. Uh, if all of a sudden it was, you know, let's see, white uh, like this, and then you went down the line, and honestly it doesn't even matter, because if you look at this right here and you say that horse is white, it's color obscuring. You can work down the line, but it's a white horse, okay? Uh, and so it doesn't even matter what uh, exists after that. And so hopefully then that you'll have a bit more of an understanding of genotype, where those basic coat colors come from. A lot of the ones that we see every day, uh, I think it's always a, a fascinating topic, uh, something that I uh, really enjoy talking about. Um, this is a, a website that I'll show you uh, when I switch back to the PowerPoint here, um, that just allows you to do uh, some combinations with Sire and Dam and see what the resulting progeny may be. We've clicked on that link now, and we get this cool little coat color calculator, okay? And so this populates uh, with uh, two boxes for Sire and Dam, and I just want to show you, you could do a number of different things. We could breed a Palomino to, let's just say, our black horse. Now, we're gonna hit continue. You could also see the gray box um, if you had gray, because again, gray is color masking. You still have that underlying base coat color, okay? Um, so our Palomino, we know what? 
Well, we know it's a red horse, okay? And agouti has no effect on that red horse. And so agouti could truly be anything. It could be homozygous recessive or it could be dominant with one of these because it has no effect. And so it's asking if you know, because that's gonna have play for the resulting progeny. Uh, we're just gonna leave it as unknown. So evolution, I'm not gonna worry about uh, extension loci. Again, black horse, you know it's dominant at the extension loci, but do you know if it is homozygous dominant or heterozygous? We don't know, we'll leave it as is. We could just hit calculate. And so this is gonna tell you the percentage uh, that it classifies. You have some that might be buckskin, some that are black, some that are bay, red, palomino. So you have a lot of different options. We're gonna lump these probably into the same one and just call them black. This smoky black um, is basically the result of what some would refer to as uh, a single copy of this cream gene with the black, okay? You'll see that with the details over here, single copy, they're gonna call this uh, smoky black. Uh, and that's what I was talking about on the previous side with that silver. But again, for the most part, people would say it doesn't really affect that black horse much. Um, but again, only recently have we kind of thrown this in there. And so it's just a fun little calculator. You could go back and do this uh, all day with various coat colors. Uh, again, there's some crazy one in here of, I don't even know, silver, amber, champagne, where they get some of these, uh, amber cream, champagne, et cetera. But uh, you can have some fun in going through and basically choosing uh, various makeups of that bay horse and that black. All of a sudden, let's say one is a gray, born a bay, but grayed out over time. Uh, and so it's going to ask you again, extension loci, a goody loci. Uh, and that gray. Okay, you said uh, it was a bay horse uh, that is gray, and so you know it's dominant at extension loci. You know it is also dominant at agouti loci. That black's restricted to only the points, and you know it is gray, but you don't know if it is heterozygous or homozygous, uh, and so because of that, uh, we're going to leave everything as is, um, and then you could see the resulting possibilities. Born bay grays out, born black grays out, or born red and grays out. Or you might have one of the other three basic coat colors that it's born and not gray out. Uh, and so again, just to give you some examples of uh, what you might have. And so with that, I hope today you guys learned a little bit more about uh, equine coat color genetics, uh, both the phenotype and the genotype. Like I said, a little later on, um, we will talk more about equine genetics, uh, but probably not quite as much on coat color. And I think it's, again, a cool topic uh, that you guys uh, hopefully gained a better understanding of, like I said, on where those basic coat colors are, a lot of the other variations that we have, um, and hopefully you've uh, got a peaked interest in it. And so with that, I'll uh, leave you for the day, and I hope you uh, have a great rest of the week.